I'd like Dr. Robert Jeffress to come on out. Um, I've gotten to know Dr. Jeffress uh, partly because I've had him as a radio guest so many times. Follow him on, on radio, online. He's a, good, thank you. <laughs> I'm going around in circles. He's a Fox News contributor. He's outspoken, uh, even more so than me. That's hard to do. <laughs> so, Dr. Jeffress, it's all yours. I don't know what the Lord's, lay I do know, I have your outline, so I do know what the <laughs> Lord's put on your heart. I just can't give the message. It's all yours. Go ahead. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Jan. Thank you so much, Jan. You know, in today's world, there are not many leaders and many ministries you can count on, but one leader and ministry you can always count on is Jan and Olive Tree Ministries, that they're going to stand firm and never waver from the truth. So Jan, thank you for what you and your ministry mean. Well, it is great to be with you tonight and uh, I had a chance to meet a lot of you before the session tonight. You stopped by the book table, and uh, it was just so encouraging to get to be with you. Uh, a lot of you mentioned that you listened to our radio ministry, Pathway to Victory, or you watch our television show, and, uh, uh, or watch the Fox News interviews, and I really appreciate the encouragement uh, that you offered to me. I'll have to be honest with you, though. Um, it's not always that way. I've discovered that being on television has a downside to it. And one of the downsides is people feel free to say whatever they want to say to you. I was uh, speaking in Washington, D.C. not long ago, and a man came up after the talk, and he kind of gave me the once-over, and he said, you know, I watch you on television. You look a lot better on television than you do in person. <laughs> he was serious. Uh, but the worst thing uh, happened uh, not long ago. A woman called in from another state who watched Pathway to Victory. She called the 800 number and she said, you know, we enjoy Dr. Jeffress' messages okay, but somebody's got to tell him he's got the worst toupee we have ever seen on television before. <laughs> of course, I don't wear a toupee. <laughs> now, you don't believe that. You want to come up and grab my hair right now? No. I've been hanging around Donald Trump too long. We shouldn't do that. No, we won't do that. But anyway, thank you for not saying it tonight, even if you thought it, and I appreciate that very much. The coming of the Lord Jesus Christ is closer today than it's ever been. So wrote the Apostle Paul to the church at Rome 2,000 years ago. But if it was true then, think how much more true that statement is today. I'm convinced that the Lord's coming is near. And it is out of that conviction that earlier this year, I wrote my book, Countdown to the Apocalypse, why Isis and Ebola are only the beginning. And in this book, I talk about the signs that I believe are pointing to the soon return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I know what skeptics say. I hear it all the time. They say, oh, people have been saying that for 2,000 years. People have been saying the signs are coming together for His coming. And, you know, truthfully, the signs of His coming have been present for 2,000 years. Some are more prominent than others. Some rise, others ebb away. And that is true. But in Matthew 24, 8, Jesus said, Before he returns, these signs will be like the labor pains that a woman experiences before birth. Now, I've got to confess to you, I've never given birth to anything except three kidney stones. And... Uh, <laughs> You know, I'm told there's some similarity between that and childbirth. But ladies, those of you who have given birth realize what labor pains are. You know that when you're pregnant, you have a general idea of when the baby is coming. But then those labor pains begin. Sometimes they subside for a period of time. We call that what? False labor. But when those labor pains begin to increase in frequency and intensity, 
then you know something big is about to happen. And I believe that's what we're seeing with the signs of the Lord's return. Yes, they've been around for a long time. They increase and subside. But I believe they are increasing these signs in intensity and frequency pointing to the fact that the end is near. And then count down to the apocalypse. I talk about three of those signs. One is the global persecution of Christians is escalating. Jesus said... You're going to see that happen when the end approaches. What we're seeing around the world is now beginning to happen in America. And I talk about that. I talk about uh, not only the increase of uh, persecution, but also the escalating immorality in our world today. Specifically, abortion and immorality and same-sex marriage and how that points toward the end times. But the sign, the third sign that I talk about is the one I want to talk to you about tonight. In fact, if you were to ask me, Robert, what do you believe is the single greatest indicator that the return of Jesus Christ is near? It's the one I want to talk to you about tonight, and that is the rise of radical Islam. The radio host asked a simple question. Can we expect more beheadings here in the United States? The answer came from Robert Spencer, the head of Jihad Watch, an organization devoting to alerting Americans about the danger of Islamic terrorism. Mr. Spencer said, nothing is more certain than that, that we're going to see more beheadings. Earlier this year, we saw the horrific images of ISIS beheading Christians in the Middle East. And then came this headline last fall, Oklahoma woman beheaded by Islam evangelizing co-worker. We have seen the atrocities of ISIS. We have seen people being burned alive, people being put in cages and drowned. We've seen the extermination of Christians in the Middle East. We've seen them crucifying children. But the question is, who is ISIS? Who are these radical Islamists? What do they believe? What is their goal? And most importantly for this conference, what do they mean in terms of biblical prophecy? That's what I want to talk about tonight. The rise of radical Islam and its role in biblical prophecy. You know, in spite of what Western leaders like President Barack Obama and President George W. Bush in spite of their comments that these terrorist acts have nothing to do with the religion of Islam, the evidence is to the contrary. In fact, it's interesting to me that what Bush and Obama have denied, the Islamic terrorists themselves admit that they are absolutely connected to the religion of Islam. If you don't believe that, listen to the names by which they refer to themselves. ISIS an acronym for the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria, or ISIL, the Islamic State in Iraq and the Levant, or ICE, the Islamic State. They want to identify themselves as a part of the Islamic faith. These militant Muslims take seriously the teaching of the Quran. For example, Surah 9, 5. Then, when the sacred months have passed, Slay the idolaters wherever you find them and take them captive and besiege them and prepare for them each ambush. But if they repent and establish worship and pay the poor, do then leave their way free. Lo, Allah is forgiving, merciful. This is just one of 35 so-called sword verses in the Quran that call for the extermination of infidels. And if you want to know who the infidel is, look in the mirror. It is you and it is I. Now, you know, people say, well, you know, there are violent verses in the Bible as well. Look, in the New Testament, which we follow, we're under, you cannot point to a single verse in which Christians are told to kill unbelievers. Jesus said, love your enemies. Muhammad said, kill your enemies. Mohammed was a man who murdered, beheaded 600 Jews at a single time. Jesus Christ never harmed anyone. There is altogether a difference between the Quran and the Bible. 
Here are the facts, ladies and gentlemen. These Islamic terrorists, they kidnap in the name of Allah. They destroy churches in the name of Allah. They behead in the name of Allah as well. You know, I, uh, a few years ago, appeared on Bill Maher's program, and I don't always agree with Bill Maher. In fact, I rarely agree with Bill Maher. But here's one time Bill Maher got it correct. It's what he tweeted after President Obama tried to deny that ISIS is not Islamic. Bill Maher tweeted, sorry, Mr. President, but saying ISIS isn't Islamic is like saying Mel Gibson isn't Catholic. Religions don't include just the ones you like. Now, let's be very clear about this. The majority of Muslims are not jihadists. We can say that the majority of Muslims are peace-loving Muslims. But of the 1.5 billion Muslims in the world, it is conservative to say that 5% embrace radical Islam. And if that's true, and by the way, even liberals admit that, if 5% of 1.5 billion Muslims embrace radical Islam, that means there are 75 million radical Muslims in the world. Now again, people want to try to equate uh, radical Islam with radical Christianity. Our president tried to do that over and over again earlier this year when he talked about the moral equivalency between radical Islam and radical Christians. For example, he said, look at the Inquisition. Look at the horrible things Christians did in the Inquisitions. Okay, let's look at that. Do you know how many Christians, how many people were killed in the Inquisition? Over a 450-year period of time, 2,200 people were killed. That is about five people a year. 2,200 in 450 years. More people were slaughtered by Islamic terrorists on a single day, 9-11, 3,000, than in the 450 years of the Inquisition. You know, uh, I was with my friend Alan Combs earlier this week in New York. And Alan really is a good friend of mine. We've become great friends. And he allows me to share the gospel every time I'm on his program. But he always brings up, he said, well, look at these fanatical Christians. You've got your fanatics and your faith, pastor. Well, look at all of these abortion bombings, uh, abortion clinic bombings that your people do. Do you know how many people have died in abortion clinic bombings? And there's not even any evidence that they were Christians who performed them. But you know how many people have died in abortion clinic bombings? A grand total of eight. Eight. Why, that's not even a good hour's work for a Muslim terrorist. That's how many people have died in abortion clinic. What I'm saying to you is when these Christian extremists, and there are a few of them out there, when they act, they are acting in contradiction to the Christian faith. But when a Muslim terrorist acts, he is doing exactly what Muhammad, his founder, instructed him to do, and that is to slay the infidels. Don't let anybody tell you Muhammad was a, uh, not a peaceful person. Muhammad was a king of war, whereas Jesus Christ was the king of peace. Now, if you still doubt this, listen to what the leader of ISIS said al-Baghdadi, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. On July 4th, he said, quote, the Muslims today have a loud thundering statement and possess heavy boots. They have a statement that will cause the world to hear and understand the meaning of terrorism and boots that will trample the idol of nationalism, destroy the idol of democracy, and uncover its deviant nature. Those words should alarm everyone. We've been talking this week about Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's uh, comments at the United Nations. You may remember a year ago on September 29th, 2014, he also addressed the General Assembly. And he said, while Islamic groups are different and, they, different and they are divided into different camps, they have this one thing in common. They are anti-Israel, they are anti-West, and they are anti-anyone who will stand in their way of exterminating Israel from the face of the earth. Listen to what the Prime Minister of Israel said. Quote, Ladies and gentlemen, militant Islam's ambition to dominate the world seems mad. 
But so too did the global ambitions of another fanatic ideology that swept to power eight decades ago. The Nazis believed in a master race. The militant Islamists believe in a master faith. They just disagree about who among them will be the master of the master faith. That's what they truly disagree about. Therefore, the question before us is whether militant Islam will have the power to realize its unbridled ambitions. What is the origin of Islam? What is its true goal today? And where will it take place and have a place in biblical prophecy? That's what I want to talk to you about for the few minutes we have together tonight. And aren't you encouraged that I said a few minutes? <laughs> if you have your Bibles tonight, I want you to turn to Genesis chapter 12. And I want to talk to you first of all tonight about the origin of Islam. Contrary to what you may believe, Islam did not originate... 1400 years ago with the so-called prophet Muhammad. No, it reaches back. The genesis of Islam goes back 4,000 years ago, starting with a man named Abraham. You remember in Genesis 12, God called this man Abraham, a wealthy man who lived in Ur of the Chaldees, uh, which is present-day southern Iraq, he called him to leave her of the Chaldees to a nation, to a land that God would show him. And in verses 1 to 3 of Genesis 12, we have what we call the Abrahamic covenant. It is the key to understanding the rest of the Bible and certainly the key to understanding Bible prophecy. You cannot understand where we are now, where we are going in the future. You can't understand any of it without understanding the Abrahamic covenant. Now look at what happened. Now the Lord said to Abram, go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great and so shall you be a blessing. And I will bless those who curse you and the one who curses you I will curse and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. Will you jot down the three ingredients of this promise to Abraham and his descendants? He said, first of all, I'm promising you a land. This wasn't heaven. This was an actual piece of real estate here on earth. How do I know that? Because Abraham packed up his belongings and he started marching, not to heaven. He started marching to the land that God had promised him. And in Genesis 15, he outlined that land that certainly includes present day Israel, but much more territory than that. He said, Abraham, I'm going to give you and your descendants a piece of real estate. And then secondly, he promised him a seed. I will make you a great nation and I will bless you. That is, even though you're an old man, you're going to be the father of a nation that cannot be numbered. And thirdly, I'm promising you a blessing. And in you, verse 3, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And of course, the ultimate blessing was through a descendant of Abraham, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, who would give his life for our eternal life. That was the Abrahamic covenant. And you know this. You know that God made this an unconditional covenant. It had nothing to do with Abraham or his descendants' faithfulness, but with the faithfulness of God. Now, that was the promise to Abraham. So he understood that to be a literal promise, not some spiritualized promise. That's why he packed up his possessions and he started heading toward the promised land. Well, they get to Canaan, Genesis 16. They get to the promised land. And they are there, Abraham and his wife Sarah. And they stay there. And for 11 years, no sign of the promise being fulfilled. No sign that they're going to have a child. And so Abraham and Sarah begin to get nervous and think, well, maybe we need to help God fulfill his promise. And so you remember Sarah came up with that idea to allow her husband to have relations with her handmaid, Hagar. And uh, Abraham uh, agreed. <laughs> I don't know how much coaxing that took, but we won't go there tonight. 
But he agreed to have relations with Hagar. She immediately became pregnant, and Sarah immediately became resentful. And you remember she banished Hagar into the Negev, into the desert region. And while Hagar was there pregnant with Abraham's child, remember an angel appeared to Hagar and made two astounding promises to her. Genesis 16, 10, the angel of the Lord said to her, I will greatly multiply your descendants so that they are too many to count. That is, Hagar, your child, fathered by Abraham, is going to be the father of a great nation that is also going to be too numerous to count. And not only that, look at the promise in verses 11 and 12. The angel of the Lord said to her further, Behold, you are with child and you will bear a son and you shall call his name Ishmael because the Lord has given heed to your affliction. And he, talking about Ishmael, will be a wild donkey of a man. Now that sounds like an insult, doesn't it? It's not an insult. It means he will be fiercely independent, he and his descendants. And not only that, his hand will be against everyone. And everyone's hand will be against him. And he will live to the east of all of his brothers. Now, this was a prophecy about Hagar's son, Ishmael, and all of his descendants. He will be fiercely independent. He will be against everyone and everybody will be against him. And he will live to the east of all of his brothers. Now, God said, I'm going to make Ishmael the father of a great nation. I'm going to give Ishmael a land. But that land is to the east of the promised land. Because that land, the promised land, was going to be reserved for another son of Abraham named Isaac. And we see the birth of Isaac in Genesis 21. Now remember, Abraham was 86 when God said, I'm going to give you this son Ishmael. And finally, Abraham thought, God has fulfilled his promise. I now have a son who's going to be the father of a great nation. Sure, I, I had to help God out a little bit, but that's okay. We've got him here. Now we can just be at ease in Zion. But 13 years later, when Abraham was 99... God appeared to Abraham and said, Hey, Abe, remember that promise? That promise I gave you that you were going to have a son. He was going to be the father of a great nation. He was going to inherit this land. Abraham said, Oh, yes, I remember that. Verse 18, Genesis 17, 18. May Ishmael live before you, God. No, God said, It's not Ishmael. It's not Ishmael. I still am going to fulfill my promise to you and Sarah. To you and Sarah. I'm going to give you a child. Look at verse 19 of Genesis 17. God said, no, Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son. And you shall call his name Isaac. And I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. The promise God made to Abraham and his descendants in Genesis 12, a land, a seed, a blessing, would go not to Ishmael, but it would go to Isaac. Now, I want you to stay with me on this. Since that promise 4,000 years ago, hardly any peoples of the Old Testament times survived. Hardly any of the races survived. You can't find a Hittite today if your life depended upon it. They're nowhere to be found. Most of those ites have completely been extinguished. But there are two lines that still remain in the Middle East today. There are the descendants of Ishmael, the Arab people, the Muslims. There is not a Muslim in the world today who does not count Ishmael as his spiritual father. You have the descendants of Ishmael, the Arab people, the Muslims, and you have the descendants of Isaac the descendants of the promise, the Jewish people. And the reason I'm saying to you is this is that struggle that began 4,000 years ago continues today. You will never understand what is happening in the Middle East and where, where this world is headed until you understand that struggle that began 4,000 years ago. You see... Ishmael and his descendants never accepted that the covenant would go through Isaac and his descendants. In fact, 
The Muslims, you know what they do? They don't like the Bible, they just change it. They just changed the Old Testament. They said, oh no, the promise actually didn't go to Isaac. It went to Ishmael. And you know that story in Genesis 2 about God taking, or Abraham taking his son out to Mount Moriah and offering him there as a sacrifice? Oh, that wasn't, that wasn't Isaac. That was Ishmael. It was later inserted Isaac, but it was Ishmael. They actually changed the stories of the Bible because they cannot accept that that land, that piece of real estate we call Israel, belongs to the descendants of Isaac. Now, make no mistake about it. God did make a great promise to Ishmael and his descendants. In Genesis 17, 20, And as for Ishmael, God said, I have heard you. Behold, I will bless him and will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. He shall become the father of twelve princes and I will make him a great nation. The Arabs are a great people. They are a fruitful people and they are an astoundingly rich people. God gave them a piece of real estate that happened to have a lot of oil underneath it. God fulfilled his promise to Ishmael. But, in verse 21, God said, My covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah will bear to you at this season next year. The Muslims cannot accept the descendants of Ishmael that this land belongs to the Jewish people, but God said it. And whenever we deny that Israel belongs in that land forever, we are denying the promise of God himself. And that's why God said, I will bless those who bless Israel. I will curse those who curse Israel. We see today the continuing uh, conflict on the Temple Mount. If you've been there before, you know there's that Dome of the Rock on the Temple Mount. Uh, The Arabs don't even want the Jewish people up there. The Jewish people say, we're going to rebuild the temple up there. I believe personally that probably the catalyst for Armageddon will be that fight for the most valuable piece of real estate in all of the world. Now, here is my point. My point is, as different as ISIS and Iran are, As different as all of the different sects of Islam are, they are all united in this single belief. And the belief is that the descendants of Ishmael, the Muslims, are the rightful heirs to that land called Israel. And they absolutely hate the Jewish people. They are determined to exterminate them from the face of the earth and anyone who supports them as well. A couple of weeks ago, I I guess it was last week, I was on Sean Hannity debating this Muslim imam over the Iran deal. And uh, Sean was showing the video clips of the Iranian people shouting, Death to America! Death to America! And the Iranian leaders talking about death to America. And so he asked me, Sean asked me, you know, what I thought about that. And I said, well, you know, it's interesting. You had Ben Carson on earlier saying uh, that he would not be comfortable with a Muslim president. And uh, this imam started squealing like a poked pig and started yelling, what does that have to do? What does that have to do with Iran? What does Muslims have to do with Iran? Blah, 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 blah. I said, here's exactly what it has to do. A person's religion shapes his worldview. And the hatred you see coming out of Iran for Israel and America and all who support Israel, it comes out of the Muslim faith. That is the bedrock belief of Islam that Israel ought to be extinguished from the face of the earth. That is what it has to do with Islam. What I'm saying to you tonight is you cannot understand the world conflict and where it's headed until you understand the truth of radical Islam. Now, that brings up an interesting question. People say, now, wait a minute. Don't Muslims and Christians worship the same God that they call by another name? One church leader I heard about opened a prayer by saying, Lord, Yahweh, Allah, or by whatever name you are called. Why didn't he go ahead and mention Krishna and Buddha on the list as well? We hear that all the time. Well, we just worship God by a different name. Let me show you how idiotic that is. Let's just suppose that Jan for the last year had been advertising that tonight's address would be delivered by Dr. David Jeremiah. Dr. David Jeremiah is going to be speaking on the rise of radical Islam. 
And so you packed in here to hear my good friend, David Jeremiah. But instead of David Jeremiah being here, I'm here. (laughs) And so afterwards, you try to be polite. You try to mask your disappointment. (laughs) And you come up to me and say, well, Dr. Jeffress, uh, it says here that Dr. Jeremiah was supposed to be here. Is he sick? Has something happened? Did he fall off a cliff somewhere? What's happened to Dr. Jeremiah? I said, oh, no, 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 that's not a mistake. You see, David Jeremiah is just another name I go by sometimes. (laughs) Sometimes I go by David Jeremiah. Sometimes Chuck Swindoll. Swindoll. Sometimes I go by Joel Olstein. Sometimes I go by Al Sharpton. But it's all the same. We're all preachers on television. <laughs> Folks, what I'm saying to you is names mean something. Because names represent something. They represent the essence of a human being. The Lord God Jehovah of the Bible is not the Allah of the Quran. <laughs> Christianity and Islam are not the same. Here are just some of the differences between Christianity and Islam. Christians believe in the Trinity. Muslims don't. Christians believe Jesus is God's one and only son and the only way to salvation for people. Muslims don't. Christians believe that salvation is by great faith in God's grace alone. Muslims don't. Muslims revere Muhammad as God's prophet. Christians don't. Muslims regard Mecca as a holy city. Christians don't. Muslims believe in salvation by submission to the five pillars of Islam. Christians don't. I want to be as clear about this as I possibly can be tonight. Islam is a false religion based on a false book written by a false prophet. That is Islam. Now you say, Pastor, that is a hateful thing to say. That is a hateful thing to say. Ladies and gentlemen, if you believe the words of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no man comes to the Father except by me. If you really believe Jesus was telling the truth when he said that, then the most loving thing you can do for a Muslim is to tell him that he is on the wrong road to heaven he is on a road that will lead him to hell the most loving thing you can say to a muslim is there is only one way to god and it is through faith in jesus christ well where is islam going what is the future of radical islam this is a bible prophecy conference what does the bible say about the future of radical islam as i look in the book of Revelation and the book of Ezekiel, I find three indications of how radical Islam will play into the end times. First of all, the Islamic invasion of Israel. Netanyahu, this year and the year before, came to the United Nations and warned the United Nations about an Iranian invasion of Israel. I'm glad he did it. But somebody beat him to the punch 2,500 years ago and made a similar warning. His name was the prophet Ezekiel. In Ezekiel 38 and 39, there is a description of a future invasion of Israel by an amalgamation of Muslim nations. Ezekiel mentions the nations of Turkey, what correspond to modern-day Turkey, Syria, Armenia, Georgia, Ethiopia, Libya, and Persia. Ezekiel says, which is modern-day Iran. We don't know exactly when this invasion happens. We know it will happen during the seven years of tribulation here on the earth. We don't know exactly when it's going to happen at that time, but what is clear is that these nations, these Muslim nations, will attempt to invade Israel, and they will be unsuccessful in doing so. And two great things will happen as a result of this aborted invasion attempt. Number one, the nations will know that God is the one who delivered Israel. In Ezekiel 39 verse 21, 
And I shall set my glory among the nations, and all the nations will see my judgment, which I have executed, and my hand, which I have laid on them. And secondly, Israel will know God's power and faithfulness. Ezekiel 39, 22 says, And the house of Israel will know that I am the Lord their God from that day onward. We don't know when this is going to happen, but there is going to be an attempt of the Muslim nations to invade Israel. And don't we see the pieces on the chessboard lining up today just for that very, very thing? The second mention of radical Islam, I believe in the Bible, at least hinted at, is the army that will invade Israel from the east. Revelation 9, 16, Revelation 16, verse 12. You know, in Revelation 9, 16, John said, the number of the armies of the horsemen was 200 million. A 200 million person army from the east. Revelation 16, 12 says, the sixth angel poured out his bowl upon the great river, the Euphrates, and its water was dried up, and the way might be prepared for the kings from the east. Now, I know I'm dating myself. I remember the late great planet Earth. Remember that book? Hal Lindsey and who popularized Bible prophecy and we owe him a great deal for putting it in the mainstream of discussion. But remember back in those days, everybody was sure this was a reference to China. They pointed to a Time Magazine article that talked about China having a 200 million mile, a 200 million person army. Well, that may be true. Today, the CIA Facebook page says China has 318 million people fit for military service. But also, according to the CIA, India has 249 million people fit for military service and 98 million from various Muslim countries surrounding Israel. So we know one thing for certain. There's no reason not to take that 200 million as a literal number. And what we know for sure is if the Muslims ever called for a worldwide caliphate across Africa and Asia, they could easily have an army of 200 million. I believe, my personal belief is, the armies from the east will include a Muslim contingent that will invade Israel. The third, I think, direct reference to radical Islam in the Bible is found in Revelation 20, verse 4. Remember the setting? John is looking in heaven at what he sees having taken place during the great tribulation. And John says, I saw thrones and they sat upon them and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of the testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God and those who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received the mark upon the forehead and upon their hand. And they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. What John saw was those Christians, people who become Christians during the tribulation. Let me say without any hesitancy at all, I believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. I'm as certain of that as I am that I have a red tie on tonight. And I'm going to tell you, I had a, a, a friend uh, that I met on the plane who was coming to this conference. And uh, she asked me uh, today as we were coming up here, she said... Do you believe in a pre-tribulation rapture? Because I read um, these uh, people who say that that is ludicrous to believe in that. Do you believe in it? And I said, yes, I believe in that. She said, well, why do so many people not believe in it? I said, because they don't understand what we're saying with a pre-tribulation rapture. We're not saying that we think Christians are going to escape persecution in the world. We're not saying that Christians are going to get out of this world without any hardship. Why, to say that is to make a mockery of what is happening around the world today. Many of our Christian brothers and sisters are going through great times of tribulation and suffering. More Christian martyrs occurred in the 20th century than all the other centuries combined. We can expect to have tribulation and persecution. But here's the difference. During the Great Tribulation, believers will not be suffering at just the hand of other people. The Great Tribulation is a time when God pours out His wrath on mankind. 
And as a Christian, I never have to fear the wrath of God. Romans 8, 1 says, There is now therefore no condemnation awaiting those who are in Christ Jesus. Aren't you glad to know that? You never have to fear the wrath of God. When Jesus suffered on the cross, he experienced the wrath of God for us. So I believe in the pre-tribulation rapture. But as you know, because of the faithful witness of the 144,000 Jewish evangelists, many will come to faith, Jews and Gentiles alike, during that seven-year period. And those who refuse to take the mark of the beast will be executed. We just saw yesterday on, or in Oregon the execution of these victims who were asked one by one to stand up and say whether or not they were a Christian. And if they answered yes, the gunman said, well, good, because you're going to meet God in the next second and shot them in the head. We're seeing what other Christians have experienced through the millennia, the, the persecution for our faith, and it's going to happen. It's going to happen in the end times. I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of the testimony of Jesus. In the last seven years of earth's history, there will be a great outpouring of wrath, antichrist wrath, upon believers. But what interested me, and quite frankly, what befuddled me for many years as I read this passage, was that word, beheaded. I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of the testimony of Jesus. I've read that passage countless times and would ask myself, this is supposed to be in the future. The future. In the future, who would resort to the arcane, grisly practice of beheading? I think we have the answer today. Jesus said, these are some of the things that will be precipitating his return. We're going to see the rise of radical Islam increase. We're going to see the attacks increase. We're going to see terrorism increase. But ladies and gentlemen, let me remind you that these awful things that are about to happen, they are simply a prelude to the greatest event in human history. Billy Graham uh, used to tell the story about a family that had an old grandfather clock. And it would chime every hour to mark the appropriate hour. One o'clock, one chime. Two o'clock, two chimes, and so forth. In the middle of the night, the clock malfunctioned. And it rang 13 times. And a little boy in the house awakened when he heard it got out of bed and ran through the house screaming, everybody wake up, wake up. It's later than it's ever been before. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it is time to wake up. It is later than it's ever been before. But remember what Jesus said, when you see these things begin to take place, Straighten up, lift up your head, for your redemption is drawing near. Even so, come quickly, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Let's, let's bow together in prayer. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I finished early tonight for a reason I realize you're here tonight because you have an intense love for God's word you have a curiosity about the end times but you know you can have those things and still spend eternity in hell separated from God there are not many ways to God there's only one way through faith in Jesus Christ when Christ comes the second time he's coming as judge of all of the universe but when he came the first time, he came as a savior. He came to die for your sins and my sins. In some inexplicable way, when Jesus hung on that cross, he experienced hell so that we can experience heaven. The most important decision you will ever make in your life 
is whether or not you will trust in that Jesus to save you from your sins. You can either trust in Jesus or you can trust in yourself. You can either accept his righteousness or you can try to earn your own righteousness. None of us can be good enough. We need the righteousness that God provides. And I don't believe it's an accident that some of you are here tonight. I think God has brought you here so that you can leave this place with the absolute certainty that when you die, not if, but when you die, when you shut your eyes for the last time, you'll be welcomed into heaven. Tonight, if you want that assurance, I'm going to ask you to pray this prayer silently in your heart as I pray it out loud, knowing that the God of the universe is listening to you. Just pray this along with me. Dear God, thank you for loving me. I know that I have failed you in so many ways. And I'm truly sorry for the sin in my life. But I believe what I've heard tonight, that you loved me so much, you sent Jesus to die on the cross for me. And right now I'm trusting in what Jesus did for me, not my own works, but in what Jesus did for me. I'm trusting in him to save me, to forgive me of all of my sins. Thank you for forgiving me. And help me to start living the rest of my life for you. In Jesus' name. Now with every head bowed, every eye closed, nobody looking around. If you prayed that prayer tonight, you really meant it with all of your heart. Would you just raise your hand briefly so I can see you? Yes, 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 yes. Many, 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 many. Yes, yes, yes. If you prayed that prayer and meant it, you did what the Bible says you need to do to have eternal life. But as many as received him, the Bible says, talking about Jesus, as many as received him, to them he gave the power to become the children of God, even to those who believe on his name. If you prayed that prayer, let me encourage you tonight, tell somebody about it. Get in a Bible-believing church where you can grow in your faith as we await the return of Jesus. Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you for pointing to us, not a thousand ways to heaven, but the only way to heaven, through your Son. And thank you that as terrible as this world seems, we know it is just a prelude to your return, an event that we look forward to, that we long for with all of our hearts. Help us now to leave this place with a renewed dedication to share Christ and his message with as many people as possible. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Tomorrow morning, I am the kickoff speaker. And tomorrow morning, I'm going to bring the most important message I've preached in 20 years. It is a message about the future of America. It's the most requested message I've ever preached before. Dr. Dobson has run it several times on his program. The message is entitled, America's Coming Implosion. And I'm going to share with you why America's collapse is inevitable. No amount of prayer, no amount of repentance is going to stop it. America's collapse is inevitable but God has told us what we're to be doing before it happens and that's what we're going to talk about and the answer by the way is not build a bomb shelter and store up on peanut butter and tuna fish no God's told us how we're to be living in these last days and for all of you who are just offended by my saying no amount of prayer and repentance is going to change this, you need to show up in the morning. And by the end of the message, you'll be agreeing with me. So I hope you'll come tomorrow as we talk about America's coming implosion. Thank you so much. Hope you have a restful evening. Jan.